I'm Rachel Gopow, and this is Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. Remember the beginning of this pandemic? Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Here's what we know. A wa- Fast-breaking developments in the coronavirus emergency in the U.S. and around the world. The number of cases soaring just today. More than 24- Tonight, the Christmas surge is here as we witness the darkest days of the pandemic. A record number of Americans have become infected and lost their lives to COVID. The single-day death toll soaring above the grim bench. And then a major medical breakthrough the very first COVID vaccines. Breaking news, pharmaceutical giant Pfizer just announced moments ago that its coronavirus vaccine is 95% effective. It comes just as the U.S. recorded the deadliest day of the pandemic in six months. Well, we're getting Moderna's phase three interim results, 94.5% efficacy for their COVID-19 vaccine based on 95 cases. But did we expect too much from these vaccines? Let's talk now about breakthrough COVID cases. That's when people contract the virus after vaccination. They are extremely rare, but in Napa County, what appears to be the Bay Area's first fatal breakthrough COVID-19 infection has happened. The The new CDC internal report not only acknowledges that so-called breakthrough infections are rising, but that they may be as transmissible as unvaccinated cases. And what about all these boosters? You know, more than 100 million Americans have now received their first booster shot, but 91 million people who are eligible have yet to get the additional shot. So basically, while the new booster is ready, health officials on Long Island say not many people are getting The pandemic in, is over. We still have a problem with COVID. We're still doing a lot of work on it, but the pandemic is over. Well, the pandemic is definitely not over. But what about the future? Can we do better with our COVID vaccines? And if so, how much better? And how do we make sense of these short-acting boosters and what we can really expect moving forward? I'm Rachel Gottbaum, and you're listening to Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. To get some answers to these questions, I'm joined by NEJM Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eric Rubin. Hi, Eric. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here, Rachel. Thanks. We're also going to bring in Eric's colleague at the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee, Dr. Paul Offit. Dr. Offit is director of the Vaccine Education Center at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Paul, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. Thanks for asking. Let's first talk about where we are before we discuss if we can actually do better. Well, I think we're doing great. I mean, if you look at where we were in 2020, we didn't have monoclonal antibodies, we didn't have vaccines, we didn't have antivirals. All we had was barrier protections, you know, sort of isolate, quarantine, test, close schools, close businesses, restrict travel. That's how bad things were. And you'd have 3,000 people dying a day, 4,000 people dying a day. We were bad off. And we were blank slate. We had no population immunity when that virus first rolled into this country. Now, now we do. We have probably 90 to 95 percent population immunity. We have drugs that can treat people at high risk. We have monoclonal antibodies for people who are immune compromised. And we have vaccines as our ticket out of this pandemic. So we're in much, much better shape. So, Eric, what are your thoughts? Remember that at the beginning of the epidemic, when we first used vaccines, they were remarkably effective not only at preventing death and preventing severe disease, as Paul already said, but they really prevented infection and transmission of disease. So there was a time when it looked like we might be able to really control disease to a much greater extent. That doesn't appear to be the case now. The vaccines do help prevent severe disease. They are stopping people from dying, and that's very important. But at the same time, We've had to lower our expectations thus far. Yes, let's talk about these lowering of expectations. Because, Paul, in one of your recent perspective articles for NAJM, you talk about an overpromising with these vaccines and a stirring up of confusion. What did we need to do differently? I think there was a false hope in a sense that was created by those original studies back in December of 2020. I mean, what you found was you found 95% protective efficacy against all manner of illness, mild, moderate, severe illness. 
there's no way that was going to last. I mean, those were relatively short studies. They were done over only a period of three months. Uh, this is a short incubation period, mucosal infection. Um, you're not going to be protected against mild disease for very long. It's true really of all short incubation period mucosal infections, whether it's flu or parainfluenza virus or rotavirus. You can get excellent protection, I think probably fairly long-term against severe disease, but you're not gonna get long-term protection against mild disease, and that's what happened. Six months later, if you look at the studies that were done, protection against severe disease was holding up, but protection against mild disease wasn't. And that was also true a year later. And I think we created this unrealistic expectation. To me, the seminal moment came when thousands of men got together in Provincetown, Massachusetts to celebrate the July 4th holiday. 79% were vaccinated, 346, despite being vaccinated, um, got COVID. Four were hospitalized, four of 346. That was a hospitalization rate of 1.2%. That was a vaccine working very well. The remaining 342 had mild or asymptomatic infection, which the CDC labeled as breakthrough infections. That was the wrong word. Breakthrough implies failure. That's not a failure. That was a moment to celebrate that vaccine. Here, here were people who, because they were vaccinated and then exposed to the virus, only suffered a mild illness. And, and I think we lost that opportunity and created this unrealistic notion that we could somehow in any long-term manner protect against mild disease, which is just not possible. The only attainable goal of this vaccine is keep people out of the hospital, keep them out of the intensive care unit, and keep them from dying. So, Eric, let me get to you for a minute. Did you somehow think we were going to do better with these vaccines? Paul is clear that they will probably never be long durability with them. What's your experience? Well, first, let me add something to what Paul said, which is that there is this annoying thing called evolution. So not only is the immunity short-lived to many of these infections, but the virus has changed and it continues to change. And it's changing because of vaccines and because of the amount of infection out there that's applying some sort of evolutionary pressure to select for these new mutants. So there's sort of a double whammy here. Our lack of ability to produce long-lasting immunity using vaccines and natural infection and the fact that the virus keeps changing. If we keep on doing the same thing, we're very likely to come up with the same sorts of answers. Chasing after each new viral variant is likely to, at best, continue what we're doing right now. It's not likely to make a breakthrough for preventing infection for any persistent amount of time, I think. So Eric, what would you like to see? I would love to see more effort put into different modalities. Some of them are being tried, although they're not being tried at the scale or with the pace that the original vaccines were when they were developed. There certainly are efforts, for example, to try to produce mucosal vaccines. Perhaps they would make a difference. Perhaps they would give us more protection against infection. So far, I'm afraid the results haven't been glowingly positive. Here's how I see this. If, if you want to try and protect against a mild infection or try and decrease transmission. You need high levels of neutralizing antibodies, especially now with these more contagious variants, which have, if anything, shorter incubation periods. So the only way to get sort of long-lived protection against mild illness is to have long-lived induction of antibodies. And that is not something I can think of a way to do unless you're trying to just boost several times a year, which I don't think is a viable public health strategy. To me, what makes sense is focus on the goal. The goal is prevent serious illness. The goal is keep people out of the hospital. I don't see how you can reasonably try and prevent against mild disease for any length of time for a short incubation period disease, knowing that neutralizing antibodies are not going to be long-lived. And I can't think of a strategy that would allow that to happen. The only other way that this could happen is if this becomes a longer incubation period disease, like measles or rubella or smallpox, the kind of diseases you really can eliminate from the face of the earth because they are long incubation. So, Paul, do we need to change our expectation here? I, I think so, to some extent. I think that, that when you hear, for example, um, the administration and public health agencies say, 
everybody needs to get a booster. Everybody over 12 needs to get a booster. And some people have said, you know, because this way you can feel a little better about being in crowds over the winter and indoors over the winter, that you're less likely to transmit, less likely to get mild disease. I just think that's a little misleading. And I think that's caused a fair amount of disappointment. Very early on, actually, you know, six months, eight months into this, having a vaccine, people would say, look, I mean, I got two doses of the vaccine and then I still got infected. And I, I do think if you could go back in time and sort of do this all over again, I wish we could have set more reasonable expectations for what this vaccine uh, can and can't do. What would we have said then? We would have said that the goal of this vaccine is to prevent serious illness. The goal of this vaccine is to keep you out of the hospital, keep you out of the ICU, and keep you out of the morgue. That is the goal. You may still get a mild illness. You still may get two doses or three doses or four doses, and you still may get a mild illness. And you may feel terrible, but you're you're not going to need oxygen. You're not going to need to go to the hospital. And and that's the goal of this vaccine. And we, it would have been more realistic to, I think, have offered that rather than this sort of notion of COVID zero. So, Eric, are you as pessimistic as Paul that we're not going to get real durability and we're going to have mild disease, as you guys call it, but what that means is we're going to be infectious and we're going to be living with this? What's your take on it? Well, I have to agree with Paul. We have many years of experience with trying to develop vaccines, and these are the characteristics of the vaccines we get. Having said that, we don't right now harness every part of the immune system. Cell immunity, for example, perhaps it could make a difference. Mucosal immunity, which certainly is induced by some other vaccines, might be an addition. It may be impossible. It may be this is the best we can do. I wouldn't give up yet, but I do think that we're not going to know unless we make some sort of investment in continuing research and development. Remember that things that prevent disease are far better than things that treat disease. So I think we underinvest in vaccines in general, and this is one where I would continue to be spending some money. Paul, you you talked about, you know, repeated boosters is not a viable public health option. We've had editorials from colleagues who have agreed, said we shouldn't be getting these even once a year. That's the current state of things. So so where do we go here? Right. So on September 1st, the CDC recommended that everybody over 12 years of age receive a bivalent vaccine booster dose. I guess I would argue that if you look at their data, the CDC data or data recently published by the United Kingdom, the question was, does a booster dose benefit people in terms of preventing hospitalization? Yes, that was true for a third dose and it was true to a lesser extent with a fourth dose. But if you look at who benefited, it wasn't everybody. The people who benefited primarily were those who were elderly, those who lived in nursing homes, those who were immune compromised and those who had high risk medical conditions. So focus on them. So essentially, There is no magic bullet. I'd like you to speak about how we should be thinking about this and how providers should be thinking about this. You know, I I started as a Red Sox fan in the 1960s, and optimism does eventually pay off oftentimes. So I'd go back to where we started with what, what Paul said. We have had a huge success here not just vaccines, but of course, a lot of people have been infected and therefore the prevalence of immune individuals is very high. So we're really starting from a pretty good place. Paul? Right. I think I think moving forward, given that we have a high level of population immunity, given that we have vaccines and uh, monoclonals and antivirals, which can help save our lives. To me, the critical thing that has to happen moving forward is a collaboration between two groups. One is CDC epidemiologists in collaboration with with immunologists and academic centers to answer the question for how long are you protected against severe disease based on how many doses of the vaccine you've gotten, based on which vaccines you've gotten, based on what your medical background is. How often do you need to get a booster dose? Is it a year later? Is it two years later? Is it five years later? So that's what you need to define. I think Paul makes an important point that I want to make very explicit. While we've invested a lot in developing vaccines, rolling them out, and other public health measures, one place we have continued to fall short is in surveillance. We really don't know who's getting infected, how many people are getting infected. And that problem has been compounded because of home testing, lack of reporting systems. We really need some sort of systematic surveillance. 
I think the important point is, I don't think we know. We don't know the answer to boosting without data. We're going to have to have a good idea of what's happening and what's working at any given time uh, to inform those decisions. So, Paul, do you envision the future of COVID to be like the flu in terms of having an annual tailored shot for each strain moving forward? Is that how you see this happening? I guess I'm going to make the following predictions, which is probably a terrible thing to do, because if you make predictions about SARS-CoV-2, you're always wrong. But I'm going to try anyway. Um, I assume this virus is going to be circulating for years, if not decades. I assume that if the entire world were vaccinated and the virus still never mutated, that it would still circulate in the community and still cause mild disease in many and severe disease in some. And so the the goal then is to focus on those who are most at risk for severe disease and make sure that we can, you know, keep them as immune as possible over time. But we will settle in to where we are with flu. Uh, You know, two years before before, uh, SARS-CoV-2 came into the United States in, say, January 2020, two years before that, we had 800,000 hospitalizations from influenza and 60,000 deaths. I mean, if we if we masked and social distance and were a little more careful about interacting with people during the winter, we could have dramatically lowered those numbers. We didn't. We accepted those. And I think at some level, we're going to get to the point with this virus where we grandfather in, if that's the right term, a certain amount of disease and hospitalization and death. I don't know what those numbers are, but I suspect that's likely to happen. Well, thank you both very much. It sounds like what we're working on now is not going to get us long-term durability, which is what I think a lot of people had hoped for. Then again, we may need to rethink how we see these vaccines. Paul Offit is the director of the Vaccine Education Center at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and he's also on the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee with Eric Rubin, who is editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine. Thank you both very much for coming in. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. You're listening to Intention to Treat from the New England Journal of Medicine. Next time, we'll hear from OBGYN specialists practicing in states where providing needed medical care can mean a criminal indictment and where patients are being put at risk. We can't function like this. We can't function in fear. We can't be fearful that every time we provide indicated abortion, we could potentially go to jail. And so... I think we're all bracing for an increase in maternal death. And the fact that we think we won't be able to change the law until women die seems absurd. I'm Rachel Gottbaum.